So now I'm going to move on to our next presenter for this morning. And it is my real pleasure now to introduce a social worker to you. Uh, and I am thrilled to introduce um, our next speaker, which is Miss Isabel Christo, whose presentation is about understanding the mental health outcomes of stroke survivors with aphasia. Isabel has been employed at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital for the last five years as a clinical social worker in their stroke team. She recently completed a master's in social work counselling, and that was in 2020. The focus of her master's research was that of the impact of aphasia on stroke survivors. She looked at the mental health outcomes and looked at developing a screening tool for these outcomes and also developing care strategies for clinicians to implement in their practice. Her research pro paper also included an account of the lived experience of aphasia patients. Her presentation today will discuss this research. Please join with me in welcoming Isabella today. Welcome Isabel. Thank you Michelle. Thank you for this opportunity to, to present today regarding understanding the mental health outcomes of stroke survivors with aphasia. It is so great to be here with you all. I have been employed at the Royal Prince Albert Hospital for the last five years in the role of clinical social worker, in which I provide mood screening and clinical support, including counselling for stroke patients and their families and carers. Before this, I worked in the acute team at the Prince of Wales Hospital for seven years. In addition, I too have personally been affected by stroke. My father suffered from global aphasia and passed away during the post-stroke rehabilitation stage when I was 17. It was at this time that I saw firsthand my, natural fa my, natural, my father's natural glow disappear. As a loved one, I formed my first understanding of how aphasia affects an individual's psychological well-being. Today, my presentation will discuss aphasic stroke survivors' mental health outcomes screening for these outcomes and care strategies, as well as provide an account of the lived experiences of aphasic stroke survivors. Understanding the relationship between post-stroke aphasia and mental health outcomes is essential for developing comprehensive treatment strategies and designing appropriate long-term care according to aphasic stroke survivors' needs. This presentation showcases the research I undertook in 2020 at UNSW, in which I reviewed current literature pertaining to the mental health outcomes of aphasic stroke survivors. I researched how best to mood screen for these outcomes and gained a greater understanding of the lived experiences of aphasic stroke patients to achieve further insight into appropriate pathways to provide support to this cohort in an acute setting. Mood screening. Mood screening assessments are usually in the form of a checklist or questionnaire. Other formats can include observation, interview, family or carer interview, and self-administered. They provide information regarding a patient's mood and identify potential mental health problems. However, no gold standard screening instrument currently exists to mood screen aphasic patients. When I use the terminology gold standard, I'm referring to the instrument not being thoroughly tested as yet. Clinicians typically use mood screening instruments with a patient early post-stroke to help focus on potential disorders. In some situations, the patient may not recognize the symptoms and disorders they are experiencing. Importantly, the score from any mood screening instrument should be used to inform treatment but should not be solely considered for diagnosing mood problems. Through my practice as a social worker, I am aware of the knowledge gaps of mood screening and psychological care for aphasic stroke patients in acute settings. These exist due to a lack of knowledge and uncertainty regarding appropriate mood screening instruments and when and where this should occur. As a result, I, I reached out to other stroke acute and rehabil rehabil rehabilitation hospitals to determine the screening instruments they were using 
which MD team member was mood screening and at what time point post-stroke. And when I refer to the words, the acronym MDT, I'm referring to the multidisciplinary team members, a group of specialists caring for the patient. The aims of the research. I found inconsistencies within the health network regarding which mood screening instruments were perceived to be the most reliable for aphasic stroke patients, which stroke MDT member performed mood screening and psychological support, if any, and when this would occur between acute and subacute care, such as a rehabilitation setting. These inconsistencies prompted me to establish my research and thus I conducted a literature review of peer-reviewed journals in which I synthesized empirical literature, which is literature that is based on observation and measurement regarding the mental health outcomes of aphasic stroke patients. I investigated the most reliable current mood screening practices, mood screening roles and responsibilities, and the lived experiences of mental health for aphasic stroke survivors. Crucially, identifying mental health outcomes will be ineffective if a psychological care pathway is not implemented post mood screening. Therefore, this review offered critical insights to assist stroke MDT members and provided the foundation for a clear policy and pathway to be established. The aim of my study was to provide valuable research that could be used to develop a blueprint within the New South, Wales, New South Wales health system and implement it in my own practice. During this presentation, I'll explain my literature review findings and my recommendations for the future. I'll break down key terms and concepts that are relevant to this research area. An important note to reflect on throughout this presentation is that through my lens as a social worker, I engage with my patients through a biopsychosocial model, which synthesizes both the medical and the social models. Stroke and aphasia. Stroke is the leading cause of disability globally. Each year, approximately 56,000 Australians suffer from a stroke with half of the stroke survivors suffering from a disability, and almost 11,000 Australians die of stroke. Recent advances in stroke treatment have greatly improved survival rates. However, a high prevalence of stroke-induced disability remains. In Australia alone, post-stroke care involved an estimated 6.2 billion in 2020. Stroke-based disabilities or deficiencies such as aphasia often cause poor mental health and psychological issues. Aphasia is an acquired language disorder regarding the loss or impairment of interpreting and formulating language. It is a common stroke-induced disability with an approximate incidence of 30 percent. The sudden and dramatic onset of post-stroke aphasia majorly disrupts everyday life and affects the quality of life. Mental health. In addition, the social impact of post-stroke aphasia is persistent and has a significant lasting effect. Communication is central to all aspects of human life and thus the onset of post-stroke aphasia causes emotional distress and poor mental health outcomes. Impacting the survivor's recovery and response to rehabilitation. Mood screening is an effective means to identify psychosocial problems or mental health outcomes and inform intervention to improve quality of life. Adopting best practices of acute care post-stroke has the potential to avert thousands of stroke-induced disability cases or reduce the onset or decrease the level of mental health issues. If patients are neither assessed nor mood screened, psychosocial problems can go undetected. When shaping my research, I identified several barriers to understanding the mental health outcomes for aphasic patients following a stroke. 
MDT members and health professionals may be unaware of the mental health concerns and assessment methods due to a lack of tailored training. Resources and education. In, ad in addition, due to a lack of resources and established pathways, various health professionals are unskilled in conducting mood screening and providing psychological care. There may be inconsistency across the MDT in assigning roles and responsibilities in assessment and psychosocial support. Further, there are no gold standard screening instruments for depression and anxiety in aphasic patients. Within the literature review, several mental health outcomes were identified. Most commonly, depression, including major and sub-threshold depression, anxiety, psychosis, distress, apathy, PTSD, and suicidal ideation. This were, these will now be discussed in further detail. Depression. Both depression and anxiety are highly prevalent post-stroke. However, depression is the most commonly investigated emotional consequence of stroke. Although the signs and symptoms of depression vary from person to person, there are some commonalities such as feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, loss of interest in daily activities, appetite or weight changes, sleep changes, anger and irritability, loss of energy, self-loathing, reckless behaviour and problems with concentration. In addition, post-stroke depression is associated with increased use of hospital services, reduced participation and rehabilitation, maladaptive thoughts, increased physical impairment and increased mortality. Stroke survivors have the highest rate of depression compared with other illnesses. Cobley et al's quantitative study identified depression in 62 to 70% of aphasic patients, despite that this patient cohort only comprises a third of the stroke population. There is a correlation between aphasia severity and symptoms of depression, including that more severely aphasic patients experience higher rates of depression. Depression in aphasic patients can be detected as early as three days post-stroke. Therefore, early identification and management of depression are important. Some threshold depression is the in-between stage in which patients' exper experiences can vary between no depressive symptoms and major depressive disorder. Undetected or untreated subthreshold depression can cause major depression, which adversely affects quality of life and rehabilitation outcomes. Ashe et al.'s quantitative study found that 60% of patients had subthreshold depression at admission in the acute stroke unit followed by 38% at discharge and 34% at six months post-acute care. Likewise, Cahuan et al's study noted that the frequency of post-stroke major depression continued to increase up to one year post-stroke from 11% at three months to 33% at 12 months post-stroke. Therefore, it is possible that due to low rates of mood screening and mental health diagnoses in acute hospital settings, rates of subthreshold depression dropped and major depression increased. Anxiety. Anxiety is the second most common psychological disorder occurring in stroke survivors and is an independent contributor to emotional distress. Anxiety is the body's natural response to stress and usually consists of feeling apprehensive about what's to come. Symptoms of anxiety are varied. However, common symptoms can include increased heart rate, rapid breathing, restlessness, trouble concentrating, and difficulty falling asleep. Survivor's post-stroke bodily dysfunction is related to behavioural and affective changes that are associated with anxiety. Morris et al.'s 
quantitative study identified that young age and stroke severity were risk factors for developing post-stroke anxiety. In their study, 44% of aphasic part participants who were screened with the behavioural outcomes of anxiety questionnaire were experiencing significant post-stroke anxiety. Distress and apathy. Distress and apathy are highly prevalent post-stroke, which could exacerbate and manifest into more acute mental health outcomes if left untreated, including anxiety and depression. Distress is considered a disorder of stress adaption, whereas apathy is a syndrome, not a diagnosis, and relates to a lack of inhibited motivation. Apathy symptoms include effect flattening, social withdrawal, indifference, and lack of effort. When a person encounters a perceived threat, the brain's hypothalamus triggers an alarm in the body, which prompts the adrenal glands to release surges, a surge of hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. This complex natural alarm system commu communicates with the brain's regions that control mood, motivation, and fear. Long-term activation of the stress response system and overexposure to cortisol and other stress hormones disrupt almost all the body's processes, which puts a person at increased risk of health problems, such as anxiety and depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problems, weight gain, memory and concentration impairment. Pelari et al. study detected the prevalence of distress in stroke survivors. At three months post-stroke, 93% of the cohort experienced high distress, and despite lowering over time, distress remained high at six months at 45%. Prolonged elevation of stress responses and cortisol levels could adversely affect aphasic patients' cognition and memory, which are necessary to, ma to maintain what is learnt in rehabilitation. Consequently, rehabilitation could be prolonged and have limited success. PTSD, psychosis, and suicidal ideation. Post-traumatic stress disorder, psychosis, and suicidal ideation are less prevalent than the above mentioned mental health outcomes. Despite the lower prevalence rate overall, it is recommended that stroke patients are screened for the potential development of severe mental health outcomes, including suicidal thoughts. Unsurprisingly, stroke can, can trigger PTSD, which is a trauma-related disorder that usually involves feelings of panic or extreme fear. It's not unusual for people with PTSD to experience other mental health problems at the same time as persistent and intense mental or physical distress occurs when reflecting on the related event. These additional mental health problems most commonly are depression and anxiety. Notably, the extent and volume of medical trauma do, do not link to a patient's level of anxiety. Instead, they are likely due to a patient's pre-existing traits or psychosocial dynamics. Unlike anxiety, which is caused by psychosocial dynamics, psychosis closely links to right cerebral hemispheric strokes. Previous research has indicated that psychosis is more linked to aphasic stroke survivors than non-aphasic stroke survivors. Psychosis is characterized as disruptions to a person's thoughts and perceptions, including seeing, hearing and believing things that aren't real or having strange and persistent thoughts and behaviours. The behavioural symptoms of psychosis are commonly reported in those who, who have experienced an acute stroke. Post-stroke depression is a leading contributor to suicidal ideation. Crota et al. study noted that an estimated 15% of stroke patients experience suicidal ideation which is double the average population. Therefore, it is recommended that screening for depression and suicide risk assessment be provided. Lived experiences. 
Although mental health outcomes are highly prevalent in stroke survivors, I found that few sources in the literature review reported on the lived experiences of stroke, stroke survivors in terms of their mental health and dual diagnosis of stroke and aphasia. The limited availability of sources on this topic aligns with evidence that aphasic stroke survivors are typically excluded from stroke-based research due to their assumed communication difficulties. Parker et al.'s qualitative study found that when aphasic stroke survivors were screened by a health professional, all self-reported negative mood changes and trauma stem stemming from their aphasic condition. Many described feelings of hopelessness and loneliness, and one patient shared feelings of suicidal ideation at their lowest point mentally. Likely, likewise, Ray and Clark's study identified post-stroke communication difficulties prompted negative self-perception and aphasic patients felt an overall sense of substantial loss. Regarding communication problems, studies that interviewed aphasic patients noted that patients felt that there was a lack of onward privacy to, con to conduct mood screening and clinical interviews comfortably. Of concern, several studies ascertained that low mood led to social isolation, which further reduced aphasic patients' likelihood of asking for support post-acute care. Lived experiences. Further, various studies indicated the clear need for psychosocial support to be offered to the patient and carer in regards to adjusting to the associated life changes caused by stroke. A lack of training and support for aphasic stroke patients' families during acute care is detrimental because families may be unskilled in coping with their carer responsibilities, which can consequently create a negative and tense relationship between the stroke patient and their carer. Overall, my research uncovered extensive evidence informing the high prevalence of aphasic stroke patients experiencing mental health outcomes, particularly depression and anxiety. Therefore, I propose that a, psycho, that a psychological care pathway must be established to identify patients' mental health status, establish appropriate screening instruments, outline mood screening roles and responsibilities, and implement additional psychological care services. This will ensure that mood screening is implemented in a timely manner and assist health practitioners to effectively refer patients to appropriate psychological support services. This could reduce the length of hospital stay and time for recovery, improve emotional outcomes, reduce psychological and emotional burdens, and avoid time-consuming and costly mental health care assessments in cases that unidentified mental health outcomes become acute. I'll now discuss the details of this proposed psychological care pathway and associated therapies and provide recommendations for the future. Psychological care pathways. Crucially, identifying mental health outcomes will be ineffective if a psychological care pathway is not implemented post mood screening, particularly when patient scores indicate serious mental health issues. A clear policy and pathway must be established to recognize and assess cognitive and emotional needs, which would identify the step levels of care, most appropriate mood screening instruments, resources required and best timing. It is recommended that mood assessment be embedded into practice, which would follow the Stroke Foundation's clinical guidelines for stroke management. Tailored training is beneficial for mental health specialists regarding the most appropriate screening instruments and mental health outcomes for stroke patients. Post-stroke mood assessment pathways are recommended to be implemented through clinically validated instruments that screen stroke patients for depression and anxiety. Mood screening instruments. Although there are no universally accepted screening instruments for mental health outcomes for aphasic stroke survivors, the SADQH10 is a valid and reliable observational measure of depression as the BOA is for anxiety in this cohort. 
Therefore, concurrent use of the SADQH10 and the BOA is advised to effectively detect other mental health outcomes. The SADQH10 and the BOA. The SADQH10 is a 10 item observational instrument recommended for assessing depression. It correlates closely with the HADS which is a universally accepted instrument used to assess depression in non-aphasic stroke patients. The SADQH10 is reported to have a higher sensitivity in detecting depression than other scales. In screening instruments, high cutoff scores indicate greater emotional distress. Possible depression is detected on the SADQH10 if a patient's cutoff score is 6 out of 30 or more. However, the, this instrument is still under investigation as it is not yet proven effective to successfully screen aphasic patients for depression. The Behavioural Outcomes of Anxiety BOA, scale is freely available instrument to screen stroke patients for anxiety. It is recommended to use it is recommended to use for aphasic patients as it correlates with the HADS anxiety assessment. The BOA's suitability for assessing aphasic stroke is yet to be determined. However, it appears promising. The VAMS. In light of the importance of self-autonomy and self-determination, two concepts that are upheld by social workers and the stroke community, I examine the feasibility of alternative screening measures for aphasic patients. Self-reporting screening measures that use pictures rather than words to reduce language dependence may be viable option for some aphasic patients. Patients are empowered through self-reporting because their behaviors do not always correspond with their internal mood state. The Visual Analog Mood Scales, VAMS, is a self-administered screening instrument that incorporates both word labels and schematic faces to anchor each end of a 10 centimeter vertical line, whereby respondents mark the extent to which they experience mood states. The statistically significant correlation between the SADQH10 and the VAMS supports the validity of the VAMS. Through concurrent use, available instruments could be used to to detect other mental health outcomes. Screening could progress to a clinical psychological assessment if low mood is detected, and this will subsequently assess for other psychological outcomes. Mood screening roles. In terms of mood screening roles, several literature review sources highlighted that social workers were the optimal MDT member to meet stroke patients psychological needs through mood screening and assessments. This conclusion was based on social workers' extensive expertise, availability, and close working ties with the ward staff. Further, it was recommended that speech pathologists work closely with social workers to assist with communication barriers, and psychologists psychologists should provide intervention for those who are detected to have moderate to severe mental health issues. Consequently, consistency must be established regarding mood screening roles and responsibility to ensure the overall success of psychological care pathway. Step psychological care. The literature review identified a four level step psychological care pathway which could be consistently implemented across the health network. In this framework, patients are triaged to the appropriate match level of care, depending on the severity of mood problems and needs. The first two levels involve several interventions, e.g. behavioral therapy, communication and psychosocial therapies that could potentially enhance mood and reduce depressive symptoms. The third and fourth levels are designed for aphasic patients with moderate to severe mood problems, requiring, me requiring mental health specialist intervention of combined medical and psychological therapies.
Aphasic patients with possible depression or anxiety are triaged to higher levels depending on their mood severity and established progress, and further assessments are required to determine the intensity of care. Training and education of appropriate mood assessment instruments and interventions for mental health outcomes are required to implement a stepped approach. Cognitive behavioural therapy. Moreover, it is worth considering the role of psychotherapeutic approaches, including patient and family focused psychological care. In terms of psychosocial frameworks, modified applications of talk based therapies, e.g., cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, should be considered. CBT is a psychosocial intervention known to be both a efficient and cost-effective. Under the CBT model, a therapist engages collaboratively with a patient to help them detect and modify automatic thoughts and schemas, especially those associated with emotional symptoms such as depression, anxiety, or anger. It is an evidence-based treatment that focuses on addressing thoughts and behaviors and helps people become and stay healthy. CBT teaches patients to think about their thinking, to reach the goal of bringing autonomous cognitions into conscious awareness and control. CBT emphasizes collaboration and active participation, thereby aiming to prevent relapse. CBT can effectively decrease anxiety and social avoidance and increase engagement in everyday speaking situations for individuals suffering from language impairment. The principles of CBT models are widely used in clinical psychology, psychiatry, mental health counselling and rehabilitation counselling. Its components include cognitive restructuring, behavioural experiments and attentional training. A goal of CBT could be to reduce the effects of post-stroke aphasia by helping aphasic stroke patients use their remaining abilities restore language abilities as much as possible, and learn other ways of communicating. Behavioural activation, a CBT component, could be effective for aphasic stroke patients by engaging them in social connections and general life activities. Behavioural activation helps the individual understand how behaviours influence emotions. It is based on the behavioural model of depression in which depression is believed to result from a lack of response contingent positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is dependent on a person's actions and a reduction in activity can lead to a loss of reinforcement. Therefore, behavioural activation aims to improve mood by increasing the time people spend doing activities they enjoy. Biographic narrative approach. Alternative, alternatively, biographic narrative approaches use life stories to support identity redevelopment after disruptive events such as a stroke. Specialised communication skills are needed for this and thus an approach must be modified for those with aphasia. Patients with severe speech impediment may be able to use pictograms or writing. The extent to which people restore their sense of identity and bring renewed meaning to their life by talking about their past, present and future goals provide purpose and meaning. Narrative therapy uses life storytelling as a coping mechanism. Disruptive life events can be integrated into the life story and a new perspective is self-generated. Life narratives facilitate the process of making sense of the illness experience, reconstructing meaning and purposes of life, and reviewing one's own strengths and resources that might help to overcome personal challenges. Solution-focused therapy and motivational interviewing. Moreover, Solution-focused therapy is a short-term goal-focused evidence-based therapeutic approach. It incorporates positive psychology principles and practices, which helps patients change 
by constructing solutions rather than focusing on problems. Solution-focused practitioners develop solutions by first generating a description of how the patient's life will be different when their situation improves to a degree satisfactory to the patient. The therapist and patient carefully search through the patient's life experiences and behavioural repertoire to discover the necessary resources needed to construct a practical and sustainable solution that can be read readily implemented. Solution-focused therapists and their patients consistently collaborate in identifying goals reflective of the patient's hopes and develop satisfying solutions. Also, motivational interviewing is a collaborative, purposeful style of communication with particular attention to the language of change. It is designed to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to a particular goal by eliciting and exploring the patient's own re reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. Psychological problems are common complications following stroke that can cause stroke survivors to lack motivation to take part in activities of daily living. Motivational interviewing provides a way for enhancing intrinsic motivation, which may help to improve activities of daily living for stroke survivors. Motivational interviewing is designed to empower people to change by drawing out their own meaning, importance and capacity for change. Using motivational interviewing person-centered techniques, the therapist increases awareness and the importance of change through sensitively amplifying the discrepancy between current issues and patient's goals or personal values. The patient then builds confidence and self-sufficiency with the support of the therapist, enabling them to develop motivation and readiness to change and promote help-seeking behaviours. Continuation of care. Moreover, continuing care is vital after mental health outcomes are identified. In addition to the above mentioned therapies, home-based supportive care services through the Stroke Outreach Service would provide continued social work intervention and follow-up and follow-up mood screening and services such as health education, supportive counselling, case management and information regarding performing daily tasks. These services are beneficial for stroke survivors and allow opportunity for linking to long-term support if required. Conclusion. Implementing mood screening and psychological care for aphasic stroke survivors in a timely manner is essential due to the early onset of mental health outcomes. However, there needs to be continued efforts to adapt processes and measures as no gold standard measure currently exists. Importantly, consistency in the health network is required to implement universal roles and responsibilities in acute settings. Developing psychological Developing a psychological care pathway in consultation with aphasic patient's knowledge of lived experiences would facilitate intervention at early care stages and could avoid detrimental health outcomes of aphasic stroke patients. Further, research involving aphasic patients, their families and professional carers is required to examine the potential of universally implemented psychological care pathway and its effects. In doing so, stroke health professionals could effectively screen and treat the mental health outcomes in aphasic stroke patients. Neglecting to do so would result in continued consequences, both economically and socially, of poor mental health being undetected. Based on this research, over the next few months at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, I'll be working with a master's student from Sydney University who I will be supervising to create a manual that will direct on how to use the most reliable mood screening instruments for aphasic patients and establish a pathway to include mood screening into routine practice. It is hoped that the findings of my research will encourage further conversation on this topic, plant a seed for future research and further policy and procedures are put in place to ensure high quality psychosocial care for stroke patients with aphasia who are treated in acute care settings.
Thank you for listening to my presentation. I hope that the information I presented to you today has been useful and will be of benefit. Thank you, it's an honor. Thanks very much, um, Isabella. That was wonderful, love. I guess what one of the things I'd like to congratulate you on is the fact that you've addressed two major issues, I guess, that we see within the association at some time. And that basically comes down to both aphasia uh, because we see that as a very under-researched uh, area and also a very under-resourced under, um, area in terms of uh, the care given. The other thing I'd like to um, address with you is the whole issue of so social and psychological support given in both our acute and rehab hospitals because it's very limited really I guess and one of the things that we at the association hear all the time is I never met a social worker while I was in hospital um, or one was not available uh, and I guess one of the issues that we always have and that I'm always on my hobby horse about is that when people are in hospital if they can walk, if they look okay, and um, or if they're struggling to walk, we're good at addressing the whole issues of physical uh, and um, sometimes speech, not all the time, but we very rarely address issues to do with cognition and social support. So one, I'd like to congratulate you for, for doing that. And I'd like to ask you if you'd like to comment on um, any ideas of how stroke survivors can, I guess, push for these services more in therapies, in, in our rehab and, and acute settings going forward? Mm -hmm. I certainly have heard um, those, you know, being part of the um, groups that you run uh, and hearing feedback from certain events that I've been to that many stroke survivors in the community are reporting that they never got to speak to a social worker and felt quite distressed quite soon, um, if not immediately during their time of admission. And then that exacerbated into the future. Um, and in uh, approaching many of the stroke units in the Sydney region and the greater Sydney region, I was quite surprised that many of the hospitals were not providing mood screening at all to their stroke patients. And uh, as we know, there is that guideline that we are to follow uh, to, which is the present guideline is that if mood, poor mood is detected, that mood screening should occur I guess the issue becomes whether or not people are detecting the low mood and mm -hmm. everybody in a stroke unit or even in a rehab is quite busy and it's difficult to, I guess, ignore the symptoms, which I guess you are very well trained to pick up. Mm. And that's why I believe very much so that a, a universal pathway is a way forward where any stroke unit, as well as the rehabilitation facilities, have a, a guideline where um, when they're first admitted that the nurse uh, or the person, um, the, the treating doctor, the treating team, they are certainly looking out for signs of uh, distress mm -hmm. and asking the questions uh, right from the beginning. How are you in this moment? Um, do you have any concerns about your psychological well-being, et cetera? And then making sure that then that path is followed of referring to the social worker. And I feel very lucky to work at RPA because we do have those measures in place where each week um, I'm referred, blanket referral to all stroke patients. Um, and then I can also follow them out in the community if um, for, there's 20 hours assigned at the moment at RPA, if, if they fall out of my time, then I can follow them up in the following weeks. Um, but certainly I think the way forward is having a pathway where there is education for staff about the risk of mental health outcomes um, and ensuring that carers are receiving support as well. 
um, and that they're not being discharged um, to both you know, rehabilitation settings or the community without receiving some type of um, check-in or intervention with a social worker that is making sure that they receive um, psychosocial education about the risk of their loved one um, being at very high risk of having outcome and also themselves to be checking in on themselves. How are you faring um, being the carer of this person? It's not only traumatic for the patient, the survivor, it also can be quite traumatic for the carer and their family. Indeed. Indeed. Just a couple of questions online. Um, the first one is, does um, having half a tablet of Prozac help improve speech and memory for somebody with aphasia? So I'm not a psychi psychiatrist in regards to I don't prescribe medication. My role on the ward is that if a patient appears to be highly distressed and does score highly on a mood screen instrument, I request for the medical team to refer to psychiatry or psychology and it is their determination with their own assessments um, whether a patient is put on uh, a particular antidepressant or endone etc. Uh, what you can do is speak to your GP and they would be able to advise you uh, and give you some answers or if you already have a psychiatrist or psychologist you engage with you could also ask them these questions in regards to pharmaceutical intervention. Okay excellent thanks love um, and there's one here that I can't read the full amount of because there's something blocking my screen but I think I can get the gist of it um, where somebody's saying that they know there's a significant link between neuroplasticity uh, and time. And I guess motor learning is, relearning is strongly affected by mood. Uh, mm. And therefore, uh, the sort of therapies that you're suggesting would be quite important um, for somebody to receive these in order to improve their overall recovery from stroke. Mm -hmm. So we know uh, in particular those who have stroke in the hippocampus area of the brain, um, the brain is able to rejuvenate and relearn um, and it is very important to, uh, and we talked about this, the CBT, to engage um, and to not isolate yourself and to reach out to certain services and programs that will help you to regain uh, the uh, um, skill bases that you lost due to the stroke, which will improve your mood and your psychological health. It all goes hand in hand. Um, and remembering that if your psychological health is poor, it is going to affect your outcomes of your rehabilitation. Mm. And to being very mindful of how am I right now? Uh, could, who could I talk to in this moment? Uh, if you're in the hospital, certainly asking to speak to the social worker. Uh, if you're in the community, go into your GP. At the moment, we, um, under the mental health care plan, there are 20 subsidised sessions uh, to see a psychologist, and that can certainly be very helpful to you. Um, Indeed, yeah. indeed. And just a comment from one of our very experienced stroke survivors that sometimes a, a person's mood is possibly associated with their frustration, that they cannot communicate that uh, what they're wanting to say and, and that they're ready to, to do um, the work that is required in, in, in rehab. Yes, and I certainly engaged in this research because uh, I recognise this frustration of you know, people talking over you over, over the bed or uh, not involving you in a care plan uh, because you're not able to communicate in that moment. And these instruments are extremely important to be aware of and know how to use them because m many people, uh, their agenda is to try and regain their speaking ability or to 
even if it doesn't ever uh, regain to the level that it was prior to the stroke, is to have the best life forward. Uh, and that is through engaging and being involved in your care plan about what you your needs are and what your wants are and to assist you as the MDT team to for you to achieve that to the best possible ability. So um, I certainly I do hope that uh, these instruments become more well known and known how to be used. And uh, I'm going to be doing some in services over the next few months at different hospitals, uh, and that will be quite helpful to them as well. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that actually going forward, uh, Isabella. And that does bring us to the end of, of your time, unfortunately. But I really would like to thank you for coming along and presenting to us today. But more importantly, I would like to thank you about for the interest that you take in stroke survivors and particularly those who have uh, the communication issues post-stroke. And I do look forward to hearing the outcome um, of uh, your work with your master's uh, student. So thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate Thanks your time having me. as well. Such a, such a privilege. Thank you so much.